uncertain life of an African farmer. Uncertain is when you're not sure about something, so things that can change a lot. <sighs> to me, graduating primary school and being a scientist was loads better than farming, which by then was taking up a lot of my time. As much as I enjoyed my holiday break, most of it was filled by helping my father prepare the maize for harvest. In Malawi, maize is as important as the water we drink. We eat maize for every meal, mostly in the form of insima, which is kind of a doughy porridge. Insima is made by mixing maize flour and hot water. When it becomes too thick to stir, you scoop it out and you form and make cakes in the shape of a hamburger piece of meat patty. To eat insima, you tear off a piece and roll it into a ball on your palm. Then you use it to scoop up your relish, which might be something like stewed spinach, pumpkin leaves, or whatever happens to be ready in that time of the year. If your family is fortunate and lucky, maybe you also have some eggs, chicken or goat meat to go along with it. My favorite meal in the world is insima with dried fish and tomatoes. Yum! As I said, insima is so important to our diets that whenever we go without it, we feel like a fish out of water. For instance, for example, let's say that someone from America invites a Malawian to dinner and serves plates of juicy steak and mashed potatoes followed by great slices of chocolate, chocolate cake for dessert. If there's no insima, the Malawian will probably go home and tell his brothers and sisters, there was no food there, only steak and mashed potatoes. I hope I can sleep tonight. Growing a good maize crop is difficult and takes the whole year. It's not just the planting and harvesting that keep us busy, but also preparing the soil, adding fertilizer and killing the weeds that grew around the plants. So it's a lot of work. Such work required every person in the family. My sisters helped with the planting and harvesting, but mostly they helped and assisted my mother around the house, fetching water and firewood, cooking and cleaning, and helping take care of the little ones, which meant that most of the field work and harvesting fell on me. Remember, he's one boy with five or six sisters. We began in July when we cleared the remnants of the previous season's harvest. So after they finish harvesting, they have to get rid of everything there was before as well and then start again. We collected the old ma uh, maize stalks and placed them into piles. Once they were arranged, Jeffrey and I set them on fire. The best thing about burning stalks were the grasshoppers. The insects like to burrow and hide in the piles. And once they saw the smoke, they swarmed and jumped out by the hundreds. We caught them and put them into sugar bags, so bags of sugar. How many do you have, Mr. Jeffrey? I would ask, huffing through the smoky fields. Lots, he would say, holding up his bag. Maybe 50. Yeah, same here. Shall we eat? For sure. The only reason we caught grasshoppers was to roast them over a fire with salt, which we did with great excitement. Imagine eating grasshoppers. This might sound disgusting to some people, but trust me, there's nothing more than delicious, uh, more delicious than crunchy roasted grasshoppers with insema. Of course, Jeffrey and I weren't supposed to be hunting and eating grasshoppers while we worked, but in Malawi, we have a saying, a dicho. When you go to see the lake, you also see the hippos. Remember in, in Africa, there are hippopotamus, hippos. The hardest work in, a, in farming was making ridges. These are the long dirt rows that you see in any field. On my farm, we didn't use a plow or a tractor to dig them, but a hoe. And digging them took all of my time. I'd start in the morning before school, waking up at 4 a.m when the land was still dark and cool, the weather was nice. My mother would be ready with a steaming bowl of fala, which is kind of oatmeal made from maize. Everything they eat comes from what they farm. After eating, I'd stumble down the trail, dragging my hoe behind me. 
Be careful with that hoe in the dark, my father would call out. I don't want you cutting your foot. Because remember, there's no hospitals. For sure. The big bright moon threw creepy shadows along the road. I walked quickly, trying not to think about Gule Wamkulu watching me from the trees or the witch planes that, threw, that flew overhead looking for fresh recruits. Remember all the stories about the doctors and the witch doctors? That's what he was scared of. One morning while I was walking, a hyena called out from the bush, Ooh-wee! and caused me to jump out of my trousers. I have never ran so fast. After digging the ridges in the soil, we waited for the razy, rainy season so we could plant. The rains usually came the first week in December. My sisters, and because uh, they need water for the crops to grow, and there's not a lot of water available. So if there's no water, they can't grow the crops and they won't survive. My sisters and I moved in a line down the rows. One person made a gash with the hoe, so some room, while the other dropped three seeds and covered them with soil and a lot of good wishes. A couple of weeks later, when the seedlings pushed through the ground, we gave each a spoonful of fertilizer to help them grow strong. Buying seeds and fertilizer cost a lot of money. And because it always happened in December, sometimes it meant there wasn't much money left for Christmas. We never had money to buy presents, especially because we had a lot of kids. For us, the perfect holiday, holiday was simply enjoying a luxurious meal of chicken and rice together. If there was any money left over, perhaps we would get a bottle of Coca-Cola from the market, along with some dandy sweets. Then after December, all the money was gone. Worse, by this time, most families' mice supplies were also running low. Outside, it rained night and day. It was a time when people tightened their belts and waited for the harvest, which didn't arrive until May. That's when the mice stalks finally stretched above my father's head and a whole green field would whisper your fortunes in the wind. Because remember, they survive on this plant growing. Harvest was like one giant party. Everyone in the family headed into the rows and work, worked from sun, from sun up, sunrise until sundown, singing, telling jokes, dreaming about the great meals to come. After we'd spent a week, Chucking, uh, shucking the ears, the mice would find would. After we had spent a week shucking the ears, the mice would was placed in a giant bag that went back into the storage room, so where they keep everything, giving us another year's worth of delicious food. In a good harvest, so when they take the mice from the plants, the bags rose to the ceiling and spilled into the hallway because there was so much. But for poor families like ours, it was like putting a million dollars in the bank. But that was in a normal year. In December 2000, everything went terribly wrong. Our first problem was the fertilizer. For years and years, the Malawian government made sure the price of fertilizer and seed was low enough so every family could afford to crop, to grow the maize. But our new president, a businessman called Bakili Muluzi, didn't believe the government's job was to help farmers. So that year, the price of fertilizer was so expensive that most families, ours included, couldn't even afford to buy it. That meant when the rains came and the seedlings pushed their way through the soil, we had nothing to feed or give them. Sorry, guys, I said as I stood in the field, you're on, you're on your own this year. For those farmers who were able to afford and buy fertilizer, it hardly mattered anyway. Because as soon as the, the seedlings showed their tiny faces, the country began to flood. Heavy rains, so a lot of rain fell for days and days, washing away houses and livestock, along with the fertilizer and many of the seedlings themselves. Our district survived without much damage, except that after the rains finally stopped, they never came back. Malawi entered a drought. So a drought is when there's no rain. So obviously with no rain, they can't grow their food. And if they can't grow their food, what do they survive on? Because they have no money. 
With no rain, the sun rose angry in the sky each morning and showed no mercy on the seedlings that had survived, so it was hot. By February, the stalks were wilted and bent to the ground, so the crops they had grown were dying. With no water, they die. By May, half our crop was scorched, was burnt from the sun. The plants that, were, that remained were only as tall and high as my father's chest. If you took one of the leaves in your hand, it would crumble to dust. One afternoon, my father and I stood in the field and studied the destruction. What will happen to us next year, Papa? I asked. He let out a sigh. I don't know, son, but at least we're not alone. It's happening to everyone. There was no celebration that harvest. We managed to fill only five bags of mice, which occupied only, a, only one corner of the storage room. One night before bed, I saw a kerosene lamp flickering in the hallway and found my father standing in the open door. He was staring at those bags, but not like a man counting how much money he had. He seemed to be asking them a question. Whatever they told him, we'd find out soon enough. So basically in this chapter, we're learning that normally um, when they grow the mice, everything is amazing and great, that there's enough water and uh, fertilizer for the plants to grow. But this year, there was no rain, no mice, and nothing for them to really eat, just five bags.